אוקיי. בדיוק. אוקיי. So, uh, hello everybody. Uh, on behalf of Michael and myself, welcome to the seminar on computational geometry and robotics at Tel Aviv University. And <clears throat> those who visited, visited us here know that it's a pretty long event. It takes two hours with a lot of interruptions from the floor, but we changed the format a little and make it much shorter. Uh, one hour, including questions. Uh, if you want to ask questions during the talk, it's okay with uh, Sariel at least. You can either unmute yourself or uh, put your question to the chat and occasionally I'll read the questions to the speaker, in this case, uh, Sariel. Uh, so I already mentioned this name several times today. Uh, we are very happy to have Sariel Arpelet from University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign to open the seminar with a talk on reliable spanners. Uh, Sariel is no stranger to this seminar. He was a student here and is a very frequent speaker in the seminar. So without further ado, I give the Zoom floor to Sariel. Thanks, Danny. Uh, so maybe I should first point out that this is a historical day. 25 years uh, ago, uh, Yitzhak Rabin was murdered. Uh, I was in the beginning of my PhD in Tel Aviv University with Micha. So, um, an event that, you know, where things started going off the rails. Now there are even more off the rails. Um, and hopefully, uh, whatever your political beliefs are, we can all agree that the fact that Yigal uh, uh, Amir could uh, assassinate him was uh, a catastrophic failure of the you know, at least a security system at the time, not to speak about the political system. Uh, and my talk is going to, to be uh, essentially about catastrophic failure, hopefully not the talk itself. Um, and the question is essentially, can we build structures and algorithms that can withstand catastrophic failure? And uh, this is, you know, something that everybody wants to do at some level, but computers and algorithms are usually not very good at such withstanding such failure. So we're going to, of course, look on very restricted settings of, uh, of spanners uh, and so on. So what I'm going to talk about is based on three recent papers. Uh, this is the work uh, uh, with uh, uh, Daniel Ola, uh, who is a student uh, in uh, uh, Idovan, and Kevin Butchen, also from Idovan. And um, I was planning to talk mainly on the third paper, but in the end, I think I'm going to spend most of my time on the first two papers and a little bit about uh, results from the third paper. All the trees are available from uh, the archive. Okay, so the first thing I want to, to mention is a spanner. So what is a spanner? We have a graph. Let's start on maybe from the easiest graph, which is just the click. Uh, think about uh, the weight of every edge being one. So uh, this is called the uniform metric because for every pair of vertices or every pair of points, I will not distinguish between points and vertices for in my language, they would be the same. The distance is one. Right? And but the problem with uh, uh, the click, of course, is that the number of uh, edges is quadratic, it's quite large. So we would like to have a, a, a sparser graph that have fewer number of edges, such that we can use this graph uh, uh, as a proxy for the distances, right? So for click, it's not very hard. You just take a vertex and you connect it to all the other vertices, you get a star. And now the distance between every pair of vertices is either one or two. So, uh, on the star here, we are using the shortest path metric. We're computing the shortest path in this graph. 
And uh, this is a good example that shows that you cannot, if I'm not allowing you to add new vertices, uh, you cannot do better than uh, two spanners unless you include all the edges of the cube, right? Uh, so, and also the name of the game in everything I'm uh, uh, speaking about today, when we pick two points and we decide to connect it by an edge, the weight on the edge is going to be the distance of the edge in this uh, uh, underlying metric. So, so whatever graph, subgraph we construct, it's going to always uh, have uh, longer distances than the original graph or metric. Okay, so we can, we can do two spanner uh, quite, e quite easily, but uh, we cannot really do better than two. So there are some hard limits. And here what happened is that um, the general problem, of course, is harder when we have weights, general weights on the edges. Uh, and usually we assume the triangle inequality. So, um, so that's that. Okay, so there's quite a bit uh, of work on spanners. In the general setting, we have a graph. We have a weight on the edges and we want to find uh, a graph such that the distance for every pair of vertices is uh, not much bigger than the real distance of the metric, right? So the input is a metric, namely a set of points and a function did the sign distances between points that comply with the triangle inequality. And we would like to have uh, a graph such that the shortest that path distance is a good approximation up to a factor of t to the real uh, distances. And of course, we would like this graph to be as sparse as possible and so on and so forth. There is a, a humongous amount of research on this because uh, you can ask this question in, first you can optimize different things like the number of edges, the the maximum degree of a vertex, the average degree, the uh, diameter of the, of the graph, the uh, total weight, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the question is also how you get the input. Uh, is it implicit like a geometric setting or is it provided as an input graph and so on? So there's a lot of research on spanners. Um, but what happens if there are failures? And here we are concerned with uh, vertex failures, right? So if a, a nodes just fails, think about it as deleting it from the graph, then uh, the click doesn't care, right? The click still perfectly connect everything. You know, it lost one vertex, it couldn't care less, but the spanner is gone, right? Uh, if I deleted the, the, the head of the stars, then uh, the wool spanner is gone. So the question is, can we design a spanner that can withstand uh, failures? And how many failures can we you withstand? And maybe the most natural uh, variant is when you allow k deletions of vertices. So this is called k follow k fault tolerant spanners. Um, we're going to have a little bit of a zoo of parameters because we care about the quality of approximation of the spanner t, and we care about uh, the parameter k, which is the number of vertices. So I apologize in advance for that. And so the, this is just going to get worse as this uh, talk progresses. And so there's a lot of work on this in geometric settings and, and also non-geometric settings. But the key observation is that this graph must have relatively a lot of edge, rough, uh, edges, roughly Kn. The reason being is that every vertex in the construction of, of the spanner must have at least k edges adjacent to it. Otherwise, it can always be separated from the rest of the graph. And then the spanner fails. So that's really bad news because if k is large, that means that the spanner has to be quite large, which is not very useful. Okay. So instead, we're going to use uh, a completely different definition. And instead of K, we're going to have this parameter theta. 
So we're going to speak about theta, uh, oops, I marked the wrong thing. Uh, theta is how much loss are we willing to accept? So the basic idea is that we construct a graph G, which is going to be our spanner. And then there is an attack. An attack is a subset of the vertices. Uh, and now what happened is that because of the attack, there is going to be a, a, a points around the, the area of attack that are going to be in the fallout area, which are damaged, right? So we're going to have a damaged set, which is going to be a subset of the attack set. And the idea is that we require that the graph remain as a good spanner, a T-spanner for all the vertices outside the attack area, right? Formally we require that the damage set, which is a superset of the uh, attack set, is only one plus theta bigger than the attack set, right? So you're willing to lose, uh, think about that as 10%, you're will willing to lose 10% more vertices than the, the size of the attack set that are losing their connectivity, but the remaining gra uh, graph should be a good spanner. Every pair of vertices are well connected. And this is a very uh, uh, powerful definition at some level because we are requiring this property for all attack set, all subsets, which makes this uh, a bit harder to design. This is a variant of a, a definition due to Boss et al. Uh, from 2013. Uh, they in investigated this problem, but under a different uh, regime of parameters. And let me show another example of this idea. So we have the attack set here. Uh, we still can connect the two orange vertices, but now they have to go around the damage set, uh, sorry, the attack set, and this part is quite long. So they're no longer well connected. So, um, so really what's going on is that we have this bigger set, the, the damage set, which is no longer uh, good. So those, one of the orange vertices in the damage set. So we are no longer giving a guarantee for this uh, two orange vertices, but now any other pair of vertices outside the damage set should be well connected. And an important technicality here is that when you connect two vertices that are outside the damage set, the party is allowed to go through the damage set. It doesn't allow to go through the bed set. The bed set is just essentially deleted, but it still can use the damage set. And that would be kind of important uh, to get meaningful results. Okay. Uh, oops. Let me return. Oops. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, okay. So, what we showed that for a set of endpoints in the dimensions, you can build a, a reliable spanner where the number of edges uh, is this uh, lovely function. So, uh, so ignoring polylog noises uh, and those constant epsilon and theta, they're constant. Essentially we're getting a near linear uh, sized graph that uh, uh, is a reliable spanner. And it's a one plus uh, epsilon spanner. So it's a very good spanner and it's theta reliable, right? I mean, the damage set is only by uh, one plus theta bigger, uh, by a factor of one plus theta bigger than the original set. Uh, I should mention that independently of us, uh, Boss et al got uh, similar result, slightly weaker by essentially a log factor and their proof is different than ours. Okay, um, now, as I meant, as I should mention, it's not that we need, there is a low ban of N log N or such reliable spanners. So. Uh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. I don't understand the model with the superset. Um, okay. Uh, so you have so, a, you, well, What is the meaning if you are allowed to use the vertices in this? So why do you, why do you care about it? Why do you, because the, for the vertices that are in D, you no longer have guaranteed that they're well connected. 
Ah, you mean when you when you take when you check that every two that every two you have a short pass, you don't need to take you know you don't need to check pairs inside D. That's what yeah. All pair uh, pairs that involve one vertex in D and one vertex outside. All I care about are now vertices that are outside the damage set. And, and you say you don't care about the size of B. I care it's about okay. it. It's going to be important, but it can be any possible B, right? There's no parameter. You said that it's a tetra real, uh, reliable spanner. You didn't say anything about the size of B. Right. Well, uh, right, exactly. So B can be quite large. B can be, it means that B can B be 90% of the vertices of the graph. But, but if B is a connected, uh, a, a, a disconnecting set of vertices, how can you get? Right, so you need to design, you know, the, the important thing here is that we are designing the graph, right? So we need to design a graph that indeed cannot be easily separated. You cannot pick a small subset of vertices that breaks the graph into two connected components. It has to be, it needs to have strong connectivity properties. But it doesn't matter how connected it will be. Whatever graph you will take, you're saying that I'm allowed I'm allowed to choose B to be any set. So I will take- Right, right. So think about the situation where you have a graph, right? And you pick all the vertices except two vertices, right? This is your attack, right? So a... you separated those two vertices, right? But, to, to, but I'm allowing this, since the attack B is almost all the graph, when I take the set D, it would be, I'm easily can include right. those two vertices, the damaged vertices, and everything is fine. I think Shahar is confused because the spanner is not a subgraph here, right? And usually when you say spanner, it's a subgraph. So here it's not the case. Uh, it is, it, uh, right, it's, uh, well, it depends on the setting, but yes, the spanner here is not necessarily a, a subgraph of the original graph. We are really dealing here with uh, points and we're dealing here with the complete graph where the distance between two points is the Euclidean distance. I still understand. If, if you take B to be any disconnecting set, every graph has a disconnecting set. But this, this disconnecting set might be huge. It might be almost the whole graph. Yes, okay. Okay. Then if so. you disconnect, you know, if you if you disconnect, you take 90% of the graph, then I'm fine. Then I have no guarantees about the connectivity of what remains. But if you take, let's say, 70% of the graph, there still would be, let's say, 20% of the graph that is still would be well connected. So uh, it seems that, that this notion is only uh, meaningful for graphs that are almost n connected, n minus one connected, or I don't know, n minus uh, literal. Uh, well, but that's the thing, right? Because the thing is that we are getting, this is the, the magic here, because we are getting graphs that are having near nearly a number of edges. Right. Um, I mean, does it make any sense to talk about a log n connected graph? Uh, graph well, what do you mean or by even, log n connected? Even n over two connected that you need to, I mean. It does make sense, right? I mean, the only sense it would make if you somehow, if the graph is such that when you remove B, then the superset will include everything and then Trivi no, but I would think it would, the damage set would be slightly bigger. It wouldn't be uh, dramatically bigger. So if you take half the vertices, the damage set would be 60% of the vertices and 44% of the vertices would remain and they would be well connected. How can they be well connected if B... Well, wait, wait and see the rest of the talk. Okay. <laughs> okay, so... I think, yeah, one should I... not wait, one should stop. <laughs> I learned today. Okay. Okay. So, um, right. So we also have, uh, as I said, we have results for, um, uh, so for the Euclidean case in all dimensions, uh, we get, uh, we get this result, which is n log n, Polylog ignoring the constant uh, uh, factors, or, uh, constant parameters. Uh, so the question is how to break the n log n, especially because we have a lower bound of n log n. So we have a, a result where we get n poly log log bound on the number of edges. But here, this is a, a, 
an oblivious model. So what do I mean by that? The uh, attacker can choose their attack set, but they don't see the graph, right? So think about the graph as being constructed by randomized algorithms. The adversary picked the attack, uh, and now uh, the damage set depends on this random graph. So it's going to be a, a random variable. And now we can speak about the expected size of the damage set. How much in expectation, uh, how much damage in expectation that tech causes. And we can, we have a construction where this uh, damage set is only slightly bigger uh, than the attack. And the number of edges is, as I said, uh, closer to linear, right? We broke the n log n bound. Okay, and we also have results for general metric spaces. Uh, this is a zoo of results, so I'm not going to go through all of them, right? So uh, let me just mention some of them. Uh, we are now assuming here that I have a graph and have vertices and their weight on the edges, and we are looking at the shortest path metric. Um, so for the easiest case, which is the uniform metric, which is the click I just showed you, uh, we showed that it's easy to get a uh, two, a distortion of two with number of edges that is essentially linear. But if you want a deterministic construction where the, attack, the attacker is allowed to inspect the graph, uh, you need much more edges, you need this number of edges. Uh, and, and we have a construction that achieves something that is roughly matching up to a factor of two in the distortion. Okay. So let me first speak about spanners in low dimensions for people that are not familiar with this concept. Um, so we have a, let's start with the one dimension case. We have points on the line and we would like to create a sparse graph that connect them and preserve resistance. So in this case, it's very easy. You just connect them from left to right, where the weight of every edge is just the distance between the two points. And this is a one spanner. By one spanner, I mean the distance between two vertices in the spanner is exactly the right distance in the graph. So there is no distortion. So that's the best one can hope for. Okay, now in Euclidean space, there are a lot of constructions. Uh, maybe the uh, easiest to describe is the one by Yao the Yau graph, where you put around every point uh, a fan of cons and you connect every uh, vertex to its nearest point in the con. So you get this kind of uh, edges. And now you do it for all the, all the vertices, all the points that you have, and you get this graph. Um, so that's a good spanner. The quality of the spanner depends on the angle of the, of the cons. The smaller it is, the better spanner it is. Uh, there is another construction based on uh, well-separated pairs decomposition uh, where uh, the construction is different. I'm not going to go into that. Instead, I want to, to rely on a different construction, uh, which I believe I talked about in the geometry seminar maybe two years ago. So this is... Uh, this construction is based on the idea that if I give you the unit square, you can find, uh, and they have a parameter epsilon, you can find a small family of mappings. So roughly one over epsilon to the D mappings of the unit square to the real line, right? Now the important thing in mapping this uh, unit square to the real line is that it gives you all natural ordering over the points of the square. So you can compute such a small family of orderings that have the important property that for any two points, there's essentially a, a, an epsilon region around them, such that they are mapped to uh, consecutive areas, consecutive intervals uh, on, the, on the line by one of those orderings. So why is this useful? Those orderings can be easily computed efficiently and so on. So this is useful because uh, we are going to just take the point set sort them according to each one of those orderings, and for each one of them, build a one spanner. And uh, together, this would form a spanner for the whole graph. 
right? And the intuition of the proof is the same proof essentially as well separated per decomposition. You look at two points PQ that you want to connect. There must be uh, in their uh, environ, there must be two close points uh, uh, U and uh, V in this case, such that when you look on the right ordering, uh, uh, oops, I might write it Q, but it should be V, such that U and V are consecutive in the ordering of the points along the line according to this mapping, which means that this long edge here would be one of the edges of the spanner we built. And now we need to recursively connect U and P and Q and V, but that can be done uh, as far as the argument inductively. And you need to bound the, the total distortion, but it's pretty straightforward because uh, this main line is very close to the segment connecting P and Q. And uh, what remains to be connected is much smaller. So induction just works. Okay, so this shows that um, if we can solve the one-dimensional problem, then we can solve the d-dimensional problem. And intuitively, we would like to do the same thing for reliable spanners in the dimensions. Okay, so let's go back to the one-dimensional problem. Now we want to do reliable one spanner. So first, because we want to do one spanner, oopala, sorry about that. Uh, since we want to do one spanner, we don't allow any distortion. So the location of the point doesn't matter. So I'm just going to assume it's the number one to n. And the distance between two points is just their difference as usual. So just think about them as being one to n. And how to make reliable? Well, it's not obvious at all how to do it, right? Um, so, so there are, the big trick is to use expanders, right? So a quick reminder what an expander here is. So an expander is a graph such that for every subset of the vertices, the neighboring uh, set is uh, quite large, right? At the same size or larger. Uh, now it's known that uh, you can build constant degree expanders uh, that, have this property and uh, those expanders are already known to be reliable at some level in the sense that if you uh, delete any subset of vertices, it's known that what remains, um, uh, most of what remains is in one single connected component and it has diameter log n. So, so at some level expander is a log n uh, spanner, which is reliable, and it has good connectivity, but it's a bad spanner, especially in geometric settings where we want one plus epsilon uh, distortion. Okay, so we need a specific version of uh, expanders. We need bipartite expanders. So this is completely a standard uh, result that we are going to use. And it says that um, you can build this expander with this parameter by just doing the random probabilistic construction. If we have a set on the left that is large enough, then it's connected to almost all the vertices on the right and vice versa. So we're going to use it as a black box. Uh, and now the basic construction of the one dimensional uh, reliable spanner is going to be, we're going to build a balanced binary tree over our uh, and points and every node in the tree corresponds of course to a, to an interval of values to a consecutive block of values. Uh, and now what we are going to do is that for every pair of nodes that are neighbors, right? They're in the same levels uh, they don't have to be children of the same parent. They just, uh, they can be consecutive. The blocks can just touch each other on some level. For every such of two blocks, we're going to build an expander. This uh, uh, expander that I mentioned earlier. So in this case, I build expander for those pair, for this pair, for this pair, and so on. And it's easy to see that the total number of edges is going to be n log n. Right? It's essentially a hierarchical structure on, to uh, on top of uh, 
uh, expanders built in different resolutions or different levels. Uh, now to say why it works, uh, one needs to kind of get intuition about what it means to be uh, in trouble, right? So if you think about the point, it's going to be in trouble if it's surrounded by a lot of deleted points. If it's surrounded by a lot of deleted points, then it's not going to escape. Uh, a good way to think about it is to think about it as in the term of shadows. So think about scanning the points from left to right, where the bad points are the red points, right? And the idea is that every time I move left, if I hit a, a, a bad point, I go up uh, uh, by 45 degrees. Uh, otherwise, uh, I continue straight, right? So I get this uh, curve. You can think about it in some sense as being a mountain. And the shadow of a point, for example, this point here, the shadow is what angle does it have to look up before it can see above the mountain? Intuitively, if it has to look quite uh, up, then it's deeply in the shadow and it's not going to be able to escape. Intuitively, to its right, it has a large number of uh, uh, bad points to some prefix of the points, and as such, it's not going to be able to escape. But the intuition is that you're not going to have a lot of points that are deep in the shadow. Like one needs to prove it formally, but one can show that. So if a point is not in the deep shadow, it's, it's shallow, then it can escape. That's the high level intuition. Uh, the proof itself is a bit uh, uh, more involved. The basic idea is that we are going to we have two points and those two points uh, are of course not in the, the attack set, but also not in the damage set. So what is the damage set? Uh, a vertex would be uh, in the damage set if there is some subtree where let's say a large percentage of the, the points stored in the subtree are in the attack set, right? Think about 90% of the uh, points stored in the subtree are, are in the attack set then we consider the world subtree to be damaged. We cannot use it. So what we are going, to, so we already have two points that are outside the damage set and we want to connect them. And the natural thing is to do something like least common ancestor, but you have to be a bit more careful because of this expander business. So the idea is that you're going to go up if you're a left child, if you're a right child, you have to go to your neighbor on the right, and you keep climbing in this way. Now, if you think about it in terms of blocks, you get this block decomposition, where the important thing is that between, for example, this block here and this block here, we have an expander by construction, right? So, and since none of those blocks can be bad, right? None of, this, none of those blocks can have a large percentage of Think about this block, for example, it cannot have a lot of bad vertices, deleted vertices, because if it did, then this prefix, this prefix would have a, a high percentage of bad vertices because the length from the source to this prefix is only twice or three times shorter than this green interval. And as such, this point would be in the deep in the shadow and it would be damaged. So we would not try to use it. So because of that, we get the, the property that as we climb up uh, in the construction, uh, every one of those blue blocks uh, has a decent percentage of its vertices that are reachable from the source point um, by a short path. And then uh, we get to the top level where they are adjacent and then we can jump across and then we can uh, start uh, going down to the target point. Okay. So this is a, you know, a sketch of the basic idea of the proof why this works. Um, and we get what we want, right? We get that one can build the one expander with endogen edges. Um, and the way to think about it, it's, this is a, something that looks like a, a list data structure that can withstand uh, failures. Right. It's a skip list like data structure that can withstand failures. 
the difference here is that the number of edge here is large. It's endogenic, it's not linear. Um, and it matches the lower bound that I mentioned earlier of endogen. Okay. Um, for the oblivious model, where we allow, um, we don't allow the attacker to see the graph, uh, you essentially repeat a, a skip list like data structure where you construct layers where you pick each one with certain probability and then you connect every vertex to a certain number of its neighbors on the left and the right. The number of your neighbors on the left and the right increases as you go up the, the hierarchy. And um, what you get then is that um, you get a linear sized graph uh, which the percentage of, uh, for any attack, the expected number of uh, additional vertices that have to be marked as damage is only a theta fraction. So, so the oblivious model um, uh, is different. Now, the, the nice thing about the oblivious construction is it doesn't use expanders. It's much simpler and uh, um, the, the basic argument is different. Okay. Um, okay, so let me speak about uh, reliable spanner for constant dimension. So I'm going to pull the same rabbit again, this uh, locality sensitive ordering, which says that I essentially have uh, the function of epsilon on a constant number of uh, orderings of the points for which I need to build uh, this one dimensional spanner. So I just do that and I plug it in. Um, I already kind of argued why it's correct. The proof of correctness is a bit more uh, complicated and requires some tricks for the reliable case, but uh, the same argument essentially works. And we get this result, uh, the n log n uh, for the uh, uh, general case and for the oblivious case, as I said, I mentioned we get smaller number of edges. Okay, um, so let me mention a little bit about uh, the more general case. Um, this would be a little bit more of uh, just telling you about spanners. So the regular algorithm for building uh, spanners uh, for graphs is uh, can be interpreted as an, an extension of Kruskal algorithm. The idea is that you sort the edges from short to long and you start adding them one by one. And if you're connecting two things that are disconnected, you just add it just like cross -cal. But the more interesting thing happened where uh, you're inspecting an edge, uh, you're inspecting an edge that connects two vertices that are already connected, right? And then what you do, you check the distortion, right? You check what is the price of going between those two vertices with the current constructed uh, graph compared to the real distance of the edge. And if the distortion is too large, you add the edge in. Right? Intuitively, you could think about that in the MST case, if you're not connected, the distortion is infinity, and then you must add it. Uh, so this is the algorithm. Uh, and usually, you know, the threshold is 2k plus, uh, minus one for some uh, reason, if the edge is 2k minus one connected. Uh, and you, and this algorithm give you a, a this algorithm give you a good um, spanner. Um, so what is known, uh, it's known that this is going to be a, a 2k place, it's a 2k minus one spanner, right? The reason why it's 2k minus one spanner is because for every edge, you know that you did not distort the distance more than that. And one can prove that the number of edges uh, is at most this number. And this is related to erdos gilt conjecture. So erdos gilt conjecture says that there is a graph with that vertices such that the gear, gear is the smallest cycle in the graph by number of edges. So the gear is larger than 2k plus one and 
the graph have this number of edges. Um, and essentially there is a big gap between, between what we know and what this uh, conjecture said. Uh, you know, a probabilistic construction shows that there is a graph, but the number of edges is much smaller. It's one over 2k minus one compared to uh, n to the one plus one over k. Um, but if the erdos gilead conjecture is correct, then the greedy algorithm is essentially uh, is optimal, which is nice. Um, Okay, so this is how you do it for uh, for general graph. Now let me look on the time. Okay, I have a, a, a little bit more time. So let me tell you a little bit about how to build spanners for uniform metrics. Uh, so I have endpoints and I have a uniform metric. The distance between any pair of them is one, which is the click if you want to think about it like that. Uh, so, the oblivious construction is kind of easy. We just randomly pick uh, vertices and connect them to all the other vertices in the graph. This is a star. So we're going to have just a collection of random stars. And, and if the, the attacker doesn't know the structure of the graph, it's going to be quite challenging, quite hard for it to pick all the heads of the stars. If the attacker did indeed pick the, all the heads of the stars, well, then the spanner would fail, but probability for that is small. And in any case, it would be the, the fault in our stars. Um, okay. Um, now one can show, this is really showing why this uh, non-geometric setting is much more challenging. One can show in fact that um, you need uh, in the non-oblivious model, you need a large number of edges. You need n to the one plus one over t edges. And since I don't have time, I'm not going to go into the argument, but it's the natural thing. Uh, the attack, the attack on, a, on a graph, uh, on a spanner is, is kind of obvious because you're going to delete all the high degree vertices. What remains is going to have low degree, but then it must have long paths, uh, which means a long distortion. Um, so let me describe to you the, the construction that we currently have for reliable spanner for any form metric. So the idea is that we build this tree that is going to have degree of n to the one over t. So the height of the tree is going to be t. t is this parameter. And now what we do is every uh, look on a node in the street, it's going to have this uh, children. Every children, a child corresponds to a subset of the uh, of the points. And we are just going to build a bipartite expander between those two sets. And we do it for every pair of children for all the nodes in the tree. So that's the construction. Here is uh, uh, intuition of what's going on. So we have the point set, we have the, the attack, the red points. We have some nodes that are damaged because a large fraction of those children are bad. So we just essentially consider this regions to be unusable. But now let's pick two points that are outside this uh, damage set. And we can look now on the natural path between them in the tree, which is the local uh, least common ancestor. And now the idea is that look on a node in this path, this purple node, it corresponds to this pizza uh, where every one of the inner cycle corresponds to each one of the children. Some of its children might be bad, right? Because they have, uh, they're damaged, they have a lot of uh, deleted nodes, but overall most of the children cannot be damaged because otherwise this node itself would be damaged. And because of, and now the, we want to climb from P, right? So we have this point P by uh, uh, essentially climbing up, we know that all the children, the child that contains P, a large fraction of it's not is reachable by short path from P. Now, every pair of those uh, children are connected by bipartite expanders. So now the connectivity uh, uh, spreads like a virus. So all the non-damaged children uh, are going to be now large 
percentage of their uh, nodes are going to be connected to P by a short path. Essentially, we add one edge to the path because of those bipartite expanders. And this in turn means that the, all the, the, all the, all the nodes stored in the subtree are good and large percentage of them are connected to P by short path and we can continue this climb up. Right? So we can continue climbing up until they meet at their common ancestor and then they are directly connected. So, so essentially we get the path between the two nodes which is distance proportional to this, uh, the height of the tree, the worst case which is this parameter. Okay, so this is a, a sketch of this uh, a construction. Uh, this is just uh, explaining it. So this graph is uh, a two tip minus one spanner with uh, this number of edges. Um, okay, let me skip this part because I just don't have time to do it and maybe just finish the talk. Uh, so a few open questions. Uh, in all the settings that we have results, I'm assuming that I'm in the, in the metric setting, right? Namely for every pair of vertices, I have the distance between them and my spanner is allowed to use this edge between. I'm not restricted to picking a subgraph of original graph. Uh, it's very, it would be very interesting to try and solve the problem for when you're restricted to be a subgraph. This seems to be a, a much harder problem. There is some recent machinery that seems promising because there is work about identifying uh, parts of a graph that are uh, good expanders and so on. But uh, this is essentially open. Uh, there might be some hope to do something in high dimensions high dimensional Euclidean space because uh, LSH helped there uh, in building good uh, spanners. So that's yet to be seen. And of course, I think the most interesting question is to expand this reliability idea to other settings. Uh, I think uh, this idea of building things that are reliable is nice. It's not completely what's the next problem to look at, but I think in general, it's a meta-interesting question. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sariel. Let's thank Sariel in the limited means that uh, we have uh, right now. Uh, does anybody have questions? Questions to Sariel. Uh, Shahar, are you satisfied? Not at all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Shahar, I can talk with you directly later if you want. No problem. Uh, so I'm curious just what is the definition of cover, if you don't mind. Sure. So, um, so cover is, well, I don't even have a drawing, but I can tell you about it. So a cover, the, the basic idea is that you have a set of points and you want to cover it with... Uh, Think of, uh, with subset, think about them as clusters that are not necessarily disjoint. And you want to have the property that for every pair of points, there is a cluster that covers them, and the diameter of the cluster is not much bigger than the distance between the points. Okay. Uh, now in metric spaces, there is this notion of partition that does this, but somehow uh, I'm not aware of any work on these covers, although it's very natural, and you can get better bounds than uh, they can, you can get for partitions. So. Okay, uh, Charles, there is, a, sorry, there is a question by Guy Evan who doesn't have a microphone. Let me read it. Can you say something about routing? How do I route after a set B is removed? Is there an easy way to find the path? So no, I don't know about the routing question. I think it's interesting. Um, I sh uh, no, I, I know nothing about it. I think it's an interesting question. Uh, it might be that there is hope for the case where you have points in the plane and the, the attack set is a convex set, because for this case, there is a construction of a spanner that withstands such attacks. Uh, it's a nice paper by Abam and Berg, uh, the Berg. 
but uh, I'm not sure they looked on the routing issue. That's indeed an interesting question. Okay, more questions? So Ariel, I have one question. In the last uh, slide, one for the last slide, you said that if you are restricted to a given graph in the open problem, yeah, the first yeah. one. So how you can do something if you have two clicks of size n, n over two, which are connected only by one vertex to each other. And then the adversary will remove these two vertex and you cannot have connectivity regardless what Right, you right, right. So that's, that's a big problem, right? Because you need a different definition, right? You need to say, you need to uh, start talking about the distance in the residual graph, the original uh, graph and the spanner, right? Because otherwise it doesn't make any sense. So, you know, if the attack can destroy the original graph, then it destroys, but then you have connected components and in each connected component, you would like to have uh, survivability, whatever that means. You know, this is a case where it's not good for a profit to be too specific. I think it's an interesting question, but one would need to figure out exactly what one wants. Probably after one has the answer. Okay, uh, are there any more questions? If not, uh, let's thank uh, Sariel again and let me put uh, the announcement of the seminar for uh, next week. I hope you can see it. Do you see the announcement? Uh, this will be a talk by uh, Wolfgang Mulzer on long alternating path exists next time, next week, same time. So I want to thank Sariel and all of you once again and wish you a healthy and good week. Bye bye. Bye, thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye, thank you. Thanks, Danny. You're welcome.